can algorithms replace academics? That's one question put forward by INSEAD's Chair Professor of Management Science, Phil Parker, who's made quantum leaps in productivity in the area of content development and making content more widely available. Phil, thanks for joining us here on INSEAD Knowledge. My pleasure. Thanks, Chris. My first question to you is, your work so far has found a lot of ways to uh, automate the authoring of content and address huge market failures out there. Now you're expanding this into the area of uh, academia. Um, how does that work? Well, in academics, you know, pr typical professors have two large tasks. One is creating original knowledge, creating original research, and the other is disseminating it. So more and more people can benefit from that knowledge. In many cases, we also synthesize knowledge from others. More recently, um, I'm focusing on actually dissemination and producing original content. So less about the mechanics of what professors do, but rather in the uh, outputs of professors, creating materials specifically for each student, creating research that would be applicable not to one industry, but perhaps to hundreds of industries at the same time. Academics typically investigate issues that they're interested in, or they spot gaps out there, and then they investigate, hypothesize. Uh, how can automation help them in that regard? Well, one idea that we're working with is uh, speculation engines. So imagine uh, if you could possibly have hundreds and hundreds of academics focusing on your particular area of interest. Well, there aren't hundreds you can find. So can we create artificial academics, as it were, that would simply speculate as they would in the normal world, and somehow that be synthesized into some conclusions. So the algorithms read the information, whatever that's required, comes back, formulates opinions, and then another algorithm with a completely different methodology might come up with a completely different opinion. And together, algorithms are basically giving you advice on what they think might be the best way of approaching a subject or a topic. And one thing you mentioned earlier, I think it was one of your professors who said, who, who was quite critical over people having automated tools and saying, you guys aren't thinking anymore. You know, will, will professors eventually say, hang on a minute, I want to do the thinking here? You still need to think of the problem areas that you should write the computer algorithms for. So the professor is still involved in understanding the important problem areas, um, and they're just facilitating, uh, the computer is facilitating, rather, the conclusions, computer programs, are always being written by human beings. We can have computer programs that write computer programs, but at the end of the day, someone is making that decision as well. So at least for the next 10 years or so, academics will be heavily involved in trying to figure out what the optimal algorithms would be for given problem sets. They'll spend a lot less time on the mechanics of running a MATLAB program, just deriving a result. Rather, they'll think about what general problem areas can I use these various tools to solve hundreds of thousands of problems at the same time? And that's what requires a lot of thinking. How might this realistically look uh, in a professor's office? I mean, do, do they need to learn how to code or create a program, or how does it work? Yeah, typically what happens uh, is that you focus on a problem area, whatever that problem area is. So it might be, my profits are declining by 37% question, what should I do? So you focus on that problem area and then you say, well, what are the drivers of all the things that could possibly happen there? And then you look at the industry situation and you actually put these situations into databases, all of the possible situations that could possibly arise. The database then churns through various solutions to those problems and then ultimately gives uh, its final recommendation or a set of recommendations. So think of it as a speculation instance. So it would work with uh, a small team of programmers working together on a common mission of solving some general problem and then seeing how far algorithms can take that problem in terms of answering questions. When it gets to the point though, I mean, machines are now sort of able to write content. I mean, how do people trust that content? Well, that's interesting. I have two reactions that I've observed. One is uh, kind of the paranoid reaction, like they're going to replace all, everybody uh, and, uh, and they'll have a bad effect. Another is that, oh, at least I can trust a computer not to be too biased, or I'll understand the bias of the computer, therefore I know what to expect. So you really get two extremes. Some people putting maybe too much trust in a computer algorithm, because actually the algorithms are written by people after all, and there is an in inherent bias in the algorithms perhaps. Uh, on the other end, it's just a disdain for the idea of saying that computers can do this because what's the last domain humans shouldn't be involved, should, should be involved in is, is, is authoring. But I, I firmly believe that algorithms and authorings can go to areas where there's just not enough people doing work as it is. These would be underserved languages on topics that are underserved, etc. 
I mean, a lot of the areas out there like uh, economics, finance, uh, that's something an algorithm can probably easily help with uh, when it comes to data collection and, and conclusions and things yes. like that. But what about the more subjective areas of, say, communications, organizational behavior? Yeah. How, does a, how does an algorithm help you there? Are there certain formulas that it can still follow in a research paper? Well, the process that a professor in a discipline which is considered a softer science would still nevertheless have to ask themselves, is there a certain percent of what I say that's highly formulaic? Do I say certain things to multinationals versus family-owned enterprises? Within family-owned enterprises, do I say something fundamentally different whether or not there's five family members versus two family members who have the controlling interest in the stock uh, or the shares, et cetera? So the person working in this subject area has to stand back and ask themselves, to what extent is what I do formulaic? And then ask, are there people that I don't address now that I could address with this formula? If there are, maybe algorithms can help me either reach those people or draw new conclusions that haven't been possible until now. Often when a professor writes a paper, they'll write it on a topic area, not knowing or even realizing themselves that what they've written is actually generalizable to a completely different academic area. We might do a, a psychology study on the effects of fear that study actually might actually apply to birds or lizards or any other plant, other species in the world, vice versa. Someone writing an academic paper on uh, pets, cats, dogs, etc., their social interaction, in fact, may be equally applicable to a business organization. But because these two disciplines don't even talk to each other or even read each other's literature, there's a lot of insight that may not be known at this point. And then, of course, using uh, authoring tools to actually rewrite the same content so it's more applicable to one audience or another. It's very similar to what we're doing at the Gates Foundation when we're rewriting content uh, on pests and diseases, let's say, for one geography versus another geography or for one plant species versus another plant species. It's the same concept. It's just that something that hasn't quite crept into academia yet. Just putting this all into summary then, what, what should or, or how do you view the professor's job going forward? What, what could it look like, look like or what do you think it should look like? Well, I think, I think uh, if you really step back and look, you know, in the 1960s we had computers to help schedule classes for professors and that saved a lot of time. Later we had uh, machine readable examinations. So students would take tests, fill out bubbles, the grades would come back automatically. So a lot of the grading was automated to some degree. And then as time goes on, more and more automation is hitting to the professors. Even something like spell check is highly automated and it helps us write papers faster. I just see there as being a continuum, con con continuing this way, but it, now it's inching into the areas that academics might feel uncomfortable with because they're thinking, well, usually I have to write the academic paper. Why not have an algorithm write the academic paper instead? Uh, a typical doctoral thesis might start with a, a proposition, a question. Well, computer programs can write hundreds of millions of questions. They can sort them in terms of what's likely to be an important question versus an unimportant question. Uh, and then it can actually do a literature review automated. So it can look through the literature and it can summarize the literature. Many things that professors do now, a computer algorithm can probably accelerate that. And in terms of organizational learning, you mentioned your clients. I mean, how are they looking to use such tools? Well, in NCAD, we're, we're working with a number of organizations that want to scale content and knowledge. Uh, we're just starting a, a very large project up with the Reliance Industries, which has uh, the Reliance Foundation, who's working with us to scale uh, content to about 250 million uh, households in India. Uh, Reliance has won the 4G Mobilecom license. Many of the languages in India have not yet produced all the content required for local rural communities dealing with health care, with farming, etc. And so we're working in various parts of the world on the dissemination of information. That's a lot of what professors do. But we're also looking at the other side of the world on the production of original knowledge. Often there's knowledge gaps. We discover that a certain strategy works in one country say Uganda, perhaps that knowledge or some of that knowledge is applicable to other areas like in Mexico or Costa Rica or the Philippines. So we're creating models to find out the extent to which knowledge can be uh, spread and is, is viable and reliable in multiple geographies. Uh, there's simply not enough academics to do all the studies required to understand that. So using algorithms, we can get a little bit closer to something meaningful for people. Okay, thanks, Phil.